thank you. Uh, very nice to see all of you here today. Uh, so what I would like to talk is about uh, using side channel for black box fuzzing. Uh, this work uh, was done as part of X-Files project. Um, this is European project for forensic research. Um, but um, the fuzzing part it was mostly uh, done by uh, risk of anywhere work. So what's the idea uh, for this topic? Uh, when we are in a white box setting and we want to do vulnerability research, we want to find some uh, bugs in the product, um, there is a lot of different methods, and you probably use a lot of them. Uh, for example, if we have source code, we can do source code review. Uh, if we have uh, binaries, we drop them into our favorite tool, we can do reverse engineering and understand how it works, find the bugs. Maybe we can do debugging. For example, if it is software, you can just connect with your debugger. If it is hardware, maybe you have JPEG or something. So you can always try to find a way to make it uh, easier to understand how the product works, um, where are the bugs, and how to exploit them. You can do fuzzing. If you have software, you can just compile it in fuzz. Maybe if it's some binary for a specific platform, you emulate it also. All of these, uh, there's quite a few methods there. But what if we are in a black box setting? So we have some sort of device, and we really want to try to understand how it works. We probably don't have any specs. We don't have documentation. We uh, don't know how it's supposed to work. What's the design of the product? We don't have the source code. Uh, we don't have the binary. If there are OTAs, they probably updated. We cannot just uh, get the binaries from uh, updates as well. The memory is protected. Maybe it is as well encrypted, so nothing really you can do. Uh, in this case, it is much more difficult. So indeed, the product then for you is a black box. Uh, so can we use fuzzing in this case to try to help us to explore the target, um, given that we have it in our hands? So that's one of the things we try to leverage, because we have a device. We can hold it. We can connect all kind of equipment to it. Um, and we can try to understand what it does based on the side channels it uh, leaks. So uh, that's just that word uh, for an example. What kind of side channels can we talk about? Uh, so the classic one, when we talk about side channel in general, we have a uh, power trace or uh, EM trace. Of the part. And uh, that's used a lot uh, in um, attacking devices, mostly for attacking cryptographic secrets. But here we can try to use the same uh, information, the traces, execution uh, traces to understand uh, what kind of um, code is executed. Maybe there is a flash memory and we can try to see if a specific uh, code tries to access flash just on the flash lines. Or we can see the USB if it's used uh, given the specific execution path. Uh, DDR memory, the GPIOs, even LEDs, all this information uh, if we can collect it and process uh, appropriately, we can try to use uh, to understand uh, what the target actually does. So that leads to this uh, simple approach. We have um, our fuzzing engine. This is uh, quite standard. If you have your software, it's the same. You have a fuzzing engine. We use AFL in this case to make it more uh, complex. Um, fuzzing engine can produce us the data which we're going to use for fuzzing, so the requests are uh, coming from... Uh, uh, and yeah, so the requests here are coming from the engine, uh, whatever it tells us. Uh, we have sort of a harness to first, we need to send this data to the cloud. So ideally, when we talk about black box fuzzing, it's still not agreed. There is some sort of interface for that. So for example, if you have a smartphone, there's maybe proprietary recovery shell, which you have no documentation about. There's no uh, information about this, but we can still send some commands, maybe get some responses back, uh, and try to understand what it does. So the harness can send the requests. Uh, we hopefully get some responses. Maybe the target is silent and gives us nothing back, but uh, at least we can try to see if there is any data back. And we can get a bunch of different side channels. Uh, so, for example, if you talk about EM trace, we, with this code, connect, uh, can collect the EM trace. If uh, we talk about uh, GPIO, the same way we can just see uh, if uh, the signal changes there. And all these traces, somehow in our harness, we have to convert into uh, a unique label. Because that's what the uh, fuzzing engine does. 
given the request, it wants to tell us, uh, it wants us to tell if this was the same path which we could just now, or was it a unique path? And that will help the engine to mutate the data in such a way that we explore the target uh, efficiently. So, the idea is quite simple, um, just merging these two approaches together. Um, for implementation, there is uh, quite a bit of different detail. So, first of all, uh, responses. Uh, that part is quite easy. If we get new response, um, we can uh, deduct that was a new path. Uh, the same with timing. If it took different time, likely we had different execution path. It was a different time. Uh, and so on. Uh, the only problem there is we don't just have these different responses independently. All of them, all the collected different side channels for each execution uh, path uh, needs to be processed together. So what we have here is a hierarchy of different side channels. So for example, if we've got different responses, it matters for us more that they're different than the, that we've got the same timings. So we don't say we've got the same timing, it is the same path. Say the responses were different, that means uh, it has more uh, higher precedence than some other set channels. So we have to define for ourselves the, uh, which ones are more important, which are less important. Uh, that's kind of how it looks in a simple case. So for example, imagine you have only two uh, sources you have the responses, the data you get back, and you have time. And you try to come up with a unique label. So, uh, the nice thing is, this is extendable, so we can always add another layer uh, of different side channels. So here we can put, for example, uh, EM trace or uh, command line of the flash uh, memory and see if there is a new command coming. Uh, but for these layers, you see we got different response and go into sub branches. And uh, for example, for the response one, the timing one, we get label one. With the same timing one, for the response two, we get different label. Uh, label for and that's uh, approach um, lets us quite easily create this graph of all different labels and um, for each new response we can just check the tree go here check if the response is uh, present this is quite simple uh, we implemented it in Python so just a simple look up in the dictionary and we see that it exists there. with timing it starts to be a tiny bit more difficult still uh, not too difficult of course we have jitter and that's always a bit of a problem. Uh, so the traces are noisy, the time is never precise. Uh, for that, still we can tackle quite easily by having the buckets saying we have timing plus minus some percentage, and that's the same path. If it's too much different, then it's different. Uh, but the moment we go to power traces, it becomes even more difficult. So it's not uh, one dimensional anymore. Uh, the traces are two dimensional. We have jitter on the traces as well, so we're gonna have some noise there. This is just from a smart card. You can see that the start of the command, uh, there is a bit of uh, different operation happening, so the timing is never precise exactly. Um, and the thing is, when we process it, we also need for the traces uh, tackle this problem with noise. So, uh, what did we do? So, the idea is simple as well. We do cluster. We have Different traces, and we want to say, is it the same label or different? So that's the clustering classic uh, approach. Um, although data is noisy, we, on top of that extra problem for us, we have to cluster them incrementally. So we get the new trace, uh, one more new trace, and we have to say, does it belong to these clusters? And if it's not, we have to recluster everything again. So we can add this new path to our data. And unfortunately, not um, a lot of algorithms are implemented in mind, faster algorithm, to do it incrementally. Most of the times, you work on a bunch, like on a set of data, and try to cluster that. And we need to be uh, sufficiently fast. The problem is, fuzzing on the device is already extremely slow. When we talk about software, we can have thousands or uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, executions per second. This is not a problem. We can always throw more cores and run uh, even more executions if needed. With um, devices, we have one setup, maybe two or three, but uh, you cannot just say we're going to have 100,000 setups and run it in parallel. That would be uh, too much effort to uh, handle. So, and of course, we talk to the target on the device, single execution, so maybe we have uh, 20, maybe 30, maybe just few executions per second. 
depending how fast the target is. And we don't really want to slow down on top by doing uh, our clustering uh, slow. So we need to have some kind of uh, efficient mode. So with that, we went to try to explore how we can um, do the clustering. So we got some traces of a smart card just to start exploring. These are actual traces. We added some noise uh, artificially and applied it to different algorithms. Uh, so HDB scan is one of the good candidates which we're considering for clustering. You can see here, uh, there are actually five different commands in this uh, set, but based on the trace only, it can distinguish two different clusters and they are quite separate. So one of the traces looks different from others. All others are similar enough, so it cannot really detect the difference. Uh, the problem is the moment we have more noise, which we artificially add here, we get more mistaken traces. And that's something we really don't want to have in our case. In some place, uh, cases, when we do clustering in general, it can be all right here if we mislabel the trace. For example, we had the same path, but our clustering algorithm tells us that was a new path. We will tell the fuzzer it was the new execution path, and we'll create the new favorite uh, execution uh, uh, adding to the uh, set of data. And that will uh, reduce the effectiveness of the fuzzer. So if we will create a lot of uh, false uh, positives, it will just slow down and uh, render out the addition of fuzzer uh, useless. So um, what we eventually uh, ended up using is uh, Yuma. Um, just for clustering, because uh, two benefits of it, it does dimensionality reduction, so we can get rid of a lot of noise just focusing on the important parts, and uh, it handles noise quite well uh, due to that reason as well. So even if we add a lot of noise to the trace, we can see it still detects the clusters properly, and it was labels just, uh, in this case, 1% of the traces, so we can, we can live with that. This is never a problem to it is never going to ruin entirely our fuzzing attempt if we are mislabeled some traces, but we try to avoid it uh, as much as possible. And of course, on top of that, um, it is not a magic bullet. We still need to have very good signal coming from the target. So we cannot just say we get any target, we connect the scope somehow to it to random capacitor and uh, see uh, the new paths. Uh, there is a lot of uh, processing which needs to be done uh, there. So if we have uh, a ammo power trace, we explore a lot of different combinations of using filtering, uh, maybe going to a uh, frequency domain using Fourier transform. Uh, that was actually quite a useful uh, method for some targets. If there is different leakage in the time domain, in the frequency domain, then we uh, don't really care about jitter damage. Because jitter will not be shown on the uh, transformed frequency traces. So that helps us to kind of avoid the whole misalignment uh, noise uh, part of it and just focus on the uh, leakage. Of course, it only will, works if your different paths, different execution paths, will leak in the frequency domain. If they all kind of have the same frequencies, uh, it's not going to give a lot of information. Uh, with uh, all these things together, so having the labeler, having uh, the method for uh, clustering the traces, uh, labeling the timings and the data all together, we could actually go and explore how efficient this method on actual uh, targets. So we tried a few use cases. Uh, the first one, uh, simple smart card uh, use case. So we had a, a Java card. We put some applet on it. Uh, we wrote the applet ourselves just uh, so we can use this applet to understand how efficient the fuzzer is. Of course, we didn't use this knowledge of whatever the commands are or anything for the fuzzing itself. We didn't give any corpus. Uh, fuzzer starts with an empty uh, corpus state. And to make it even more difficult, we did not uh, give any data responses for different commands. All the responses are the same. The status word is what the smart card prefers. Always 1900. So, uh, in this case, Fuzzer cannot really rely too much on the data. It has to rely on the side channel uh, just to see how efficient it is. So, that's more or less uh, the code uh, you can see here. Uh, so, always we return the same uh, status code. There are some different commands. So, for example, one of them would fill the array with data, array, 
another one would use the user provided uh, value and fill that many bytes and so on. So it is quite simple, but it just does a bit of different uh, usual uh, operations what a lot of other smartphones would do. So if we just get the traces uh, with this code just to see how it looks like, you already see uh, that there is a potential for using these traces for distinguishing the commands. You can see these are all different commands. And uh, the traces to human already look quite different. So the uh, clustering algorithm sort of have too much uh, trouble. And the timing for the traces also different. So uh, in this case, having like a small target, which is not too fast, and often uh, smart cards are black boxes. So you don't even have the source code. So for this use case, it is quite actually it can be useful to apply this uh, method to explore. And uh, yeah, that's the results. So for the benchmark, we compared it to uh, just sending random data uh, without any feedback. Just throw the data at it uh, and see what kind of paths we can cover. You can see that the random approach is not really going to explore in depth because the moment you covered all your basic uh, inputs, uh, you have to brute force the uh, values entirely, and then you don't have the coverage information. So it will just flatline. For a very long time, sometime later, you might bump just by accident, brute forcing some constant, which you have to go uh, to get the deep coverage. But for most of it, it will be uh, useless. For the fuzzing uh, approach, you can see there is already quite a bit of a tiny bit of difference on the first uh, twenty thousand executions. Uh, these are the number of executions, and this is the coverage percentages. Um, and uh, eventually, uh, it uh, also slows down. Further executions uh, because then it takes more time to brute force, uh, but still, eventually, you would expect to get the higher, higher numbers. So, that was already uh, nice. Of course, we wrote this code ourselves, so this is not too much of a challenge for the black box scenario. Um, we were considering trying to do it on some kind of black box uh, targets. The only problem is it is quite difficult to assess the results. So to see how deep we built in the code, uh, did we find something useful or was it just noise? So for this presentation, we uh, tried to use a real-life-ish uh, target. So this is a Pine phone. Uh, it is an open source phone. It has, um, the code is available. It has U-boot as one of the boot stages. So we tried to use it uh, for uh, assessing how the fish is possible to be here. And uh, we, the nice thing is it has the depth port. The Pine64 has the same as you see as the phone itself. So we uh, can run the code on the depth port and try to explore it there and see how it can be useful uh, in a more realistic scenario. And having the source code and the specs can help us to understand did we, what we found with the fuzzer. Was it actual differences in the code or was it just uh, false? So, yeah, we have the source code, and uh, it is real life, but it's not necessarily a secure phone. So, you will see later this uh, uh, U-boot implementation is uh, not really protected from anything. This phone doesn't have secure boot as well, so it's just uh, U-boot uh, for the uh, in the Um That's how the setup looks. Uh, quite simple and elegant, um, if I say so. Uh, it, uh, the three main components, we have the scope, uh, we have a few, uh, serial interfaces uh, here on top, you can see there is relay board, we want to reset the target, sometimes it would crash, hopefully, uh, or it would, uh, hang, so we need to reset it so we can, uh, continue fuzzing, and we have the target here with, a uh, yeah, one code. And you see, you can trust me here because I use the jumper wire to connect the one probe uh, to hold the two Um So with that, we can do our attempt in uh, passing the target. Um, this is some of the results we got. We didn't spend too much time on it, but first we started with no corpus at all. So we didn't tell the fuzzer whatever the commands are, uh, gave the empty corpus, and it starts to explore. And just after a few hours, it will already find uh, 16 different commands. Uh, just based, uh, in this case, we used only responses from the target and uh, timing. So we didn't use uh, traces, uh, power traces here, because the target is much noisier. With a smart card use case, we see very distinct traces. 
here uh, EM trace of the SOG is not really useful. What could be useful here is using some other side channel, for example, um, uh, lines to the flash. So if you connect to the command line of the flash, you can see if there are more commands sent, because there are some paths in your boot which will trigger it, or using some other side channel. Well, using the EM in general, like on the SOG, is not really uh, helpful. And yeah, execution is not super fast. We get uh, six attempts uh, per second on average, uh, which is uh, not uh, amazing, but that's the best we do uh, when we do on device phone. And yeah, that's how it looks. Not really anything uh, new to you, I guess, if you've done fast before, this is AFL, in AFL actually. Um, it's a bit of a special build, but for the rest, it does the same as uh, normally you have. One of the things which actually we had to struggle a lot is stability. So normally, when you have traditional fuzzing, unless you have some weird code, like monistic or random stuff returning from the target, you don't really care about stability, you see it's 100% all the time, and so good. For us, given that we have traces, and it's all a bit of uh, jittery, with noise and stuff, uh, we can see if we are not careful uh, in uh, processing it, it can drop almost to zero, so it makes it totally useless to fuzz. So uh, that's something you really have to uh, pay attention to, see how useful your uh, side channel data. If specific side channel is not useful, you can always swap it for another side channel. So you can say, if uh, you know, uh, EM doesn't give me any additional information, just don't use it. Uh, maybe just like we did here, focusing the timing on it, which was uh, useful. Uh, another attempt we tried is to do it with uh, all the available commands. It's you, but it's not too difficult to guess what the commands are going to be. So we gave it to the father, uh, let it run for a little while, and uh, see how well it works for. Um, it could find a bit more things. Uh, that's uh, nice. And uh, the best part, well, of course, eventually flat lines, and then it, you have to spend much more time. So here, it is not long execution, only a uh, few hours. And given the speed, of course, just few attempts per second, this is not a lot. So you would like ideally run it for a few weeks and uh, see how far it will get to actually get some interesting things. But as I mentioned before, this is not really a very secure, protected target. So even after a few hours, we could see that. And that is actually very nice. So if you're familiar with your boot, um, this is the command uh, father sent. This is MD, memory display, uh, which will uh, supposed to print some data, but uh, it crashes because the address it tries to use here is not really valid and that be some excess address. Um, uh, what nice about this target is that we get these crash dumps and that's uh, a great thing. We didn't really focus a lot in this research on handling the crashes, which is the whole different problem in generic black box scenario. Uh, when you have just, for example, no information and only the trace, and you try to understand did the target crash or not, uh, that would be a uh, whole different story to figure it out. Um, ideally, for this use case, it is very simple. Every time we get the crash, we get a beautiful dump, and we don't have to worry about that. So that was nice. Uh, we could see that it actually works for two different targets, uh, being very happy about the results. Uh, and then looking at the one of the runs of the father, we found something interesting and we explored it a bit deeper. So this is CRC command. Another command is you do the commands is CRC of the memory for whatever it uh, that's probably not something you want to have on your phone, but that's what my phone does. Uh, the syntax is simple. You have uh, CRC command, you give it the address and length, and it will compute CRC. And no surprise, we've got a few different paths because the data return is different because it's CRC. Uh, Check is different for these memories. But what we also found that the time it took to execute these commands was also different. And that was a bit unexpected because you wouldn't expect CRC really be time dependent on the date itself much. You would uh, expect uh, the length very uh, uh, mean a lot, but even given the same length, length of CRC, you would expect close enough times. So we uh, explored it more, run for the CRC command only. This is just a few hours of execution. We've got a lot of different plots. And uh, if we plot the timings we've got from the father, that's how it looks like. And you see, this is not really complete. We'll have to run it for uh, a few more hours. But you see, there's some artifacts you would expect from the father. Uh, this line is a lot of different plots, so a lot of different attempts the father could 
on this line. So this is actually where the timings increase or whatever. So, uh, on the bottom we have the addresses just incrementally and on the top is timing. So it's normally it takes just above, uh, uh, just below a milliseconds to uh, compute CRC of uh, 4000 hex bytes. And uh, for some addresses it takes much longer. So it looks somewhat like this. And this is not really the behavior we expected very much. Um, but if we run it for longer, and one of the benefits of this target, we could get the uh, data sheet of this target. Uh, what we can see, there are different memories at these addresses, actually different, uh, different physical memories. So for example, we have uh, bootstrap rules, which is successful there, or we have uh, different SRAMs, or later on we have DDR. And although CRC computation itself is close enough uh, for different data, uh, we get the different timings just because the hardware underneath is uh, different. Uh, for example, here as well, we see at this address, somewhere at 41,000, we start to get to different timing. This is not even in the memory map, but uh, exploring a bit more, there is some uh, peripherals, some uh, control registers. We can still compute CRC of this memory, we can just see that it takes longer than when we do it over SRAM. And that was uh, one unexpected result from this uh, research. We were planning to try to use side channel for getting information about software which runs on the target, but we also could see the differences in actual hardware underneath. And uh, that was a nice uh, bonus. Um, and yeah, just for the, uh, to see how actually different it is, we can do it uh, separately uh, later to check how much it differs for different memory, uh, uh, difficult, uh, different uh, physical memories. So for example, you can see there are some SRAM, which is much faster than another SRAM, or DDR, of course, is much, much faster than any other memory. Uh, and this information actually can help you to explore. And you can see the difference is quite big, so you can actually rely on uh, side channel uh, timing information here quite, uh, quite well. Uh, and that's uh, most of the presentation. So a uh, few takeaways. Uh, we tried to do and apply coverage-guided fuzzing to black box targets. It worked for multiple different targets. Not all the side channels are equally useful for different ones. But uh, with enough of uh, manual exploration, that can be uh, useful to, if you have to explore a target about which you don't know anything. Um, the fuzzing is very slow. That's very important to know. So if you have, if you can help the corpus make it better, and give like useful things for the fuzzer to start, that helps a lot. And uh, the syntax is also a big thing. So if you get uh, illegal syntax, uh, like for complex commands, and you can help the fuzzer with the syntax, that can also improve your performance uh, a lot. And sometimes for software, you don't really have to care. You can ignore, just throw more cores, or wait for a bit longer. Here, you would have to wait a long, long time if you have wrong syntax. So if you can help that, uh, make it less black box for the fuzzer, that uh, always uh, helps. And uh, finally, something we didn't even expect. So we don't only detect uh, software differences with this approach, but also we can see hardware differences, which is a nice uh, thing. Thank you very much. That's uh, all I uh, had to present today. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank Thanks, Sergey. Uh, do we have questions to Sergey from the audience? Yes, we do. Thank you very much. Uh, I find this a very fascinating approach. And the reason is that uh, for typical software fuzzing, we associate the idea of coverage to the, to the coverage of software path, of basic work. So that's basically the, uh, the space that we're exploring, and we assign this to the meaning of we are going through the different software branches and exploring it for fuzzing. What we are exploring here is something, a different space. The different dimension is the, the dimension of the difference that we can perceive through side channels. So, for example, if you actually hit two different software paths in code, they actually have the same timing and the same side channel response, they would not be distinguishable in, uh, in what we see. Is this correct? You know what I'm saying? 
Yes, yeah. So uh, that's how, so the question. Sorry, uh, the, 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 how do, do you think this could relate? So this because of the idea of fuzzing code, while the idea of fuzzing to information that maybe not exactly related to the actual the code coverage. Uh, how do you think this which direction would bring us? Because I think this would be something very interesting, or something quite different. Uh, would these two notions of coverage match at some point in time? Thank you. Yeah, so indeed, uh, while in software we mostly fo uh, focus on this uh, separate blocks, like separate execution blocks, here we focused on the whole execution trace. So it was a bit of a different uh, approach. What one uh, thing we could uh, borrow from software, so normally you focus on separate blocks, here we take the whole trace, we could also subsplit different uh, traces, like side channel and also focus on parts of it to see if there is more information we can recover from it. So we can get a bit more from software, like going for basic blocks of uh, if we can detect this information in sidechain. So of course for timing you cannot just how long it takes, but maybe for uh, trace you can see, uh, you know, there is access to flash in the first millisecond and there is access to USB in the next uh, millisecond. And that will give us the notion of basic blocks like in software, and that would be maybe one nice thing to add to the conclusion. Follow up to, to what just is just saying is that do you think we could implement instead of rather than clustering traces, let's say clustering sub blocks in order to say this looks similar in general and this would be a block. Would that fe be feasible? Well uh, feasible part is a difficult question. We consider that. Uh, the problem is uh, we start to get a lot of noise uh, very quickly. So if we subsplit it a lot it's gonna um, put more pressure on us to be very precise for each of them. But indeed, if uh, there is a target which doesn't give us too much trouble with side channels, that's something we could do. Like if we see separate, very clear uh, parts of uh, that, we can subsplit the traces and try to cluster them separately to get more information. Right. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay, uh, another round of applause to Sergey.